Today we're going to talk about Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. And we're going to focus on Amber Heard because she's the one on um, the stand right now. And as we go through these videos, keep in mind, and remember me saying this, there are people watching this that have gone through similar situations and, sim and situations that are 10,000 times worse than this. We know that. We understand that. So also keep in mind as we go through this, we're just telling you about the body language we're seeing in these people. That's it. We're not for her. We're not against her. We're not for him and we're not against him. We're neutral. We're just telling you about the body language we see in the videos we're watching. That's it. Now, having said that, here we go. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, a couple of things, guys. If you are a survivor of domestic violence, there could be some triggering things in here. So just be aware of that because there's some testimony that gets up against that. The second thing to tell you is that we are very cautious and keep our show standards. So we do not cover the most graphic portions of this. So if you ask why not, that's why not. And we'll go with that. You know, get out of school as fast as I could. And I wanted to do, I wanted to do more things with my life than stay in Texas. So what types of things, so where did you go to school when you were um, younger? I was a scholarship kid at a Catholic school um, growing up, uh, several different Catholic schools, but they were always in the other, you know, on the other side of town in the wealthier part of town. And um, I grew up quite um, working class and, uh, and, and thankfully with, um, you know, as long as I maintained an A average, I, uh, I I enjoyed the benefit of a scholarship, and I did that until I realized that I could take my GED and SATs early, and I did that and placed out of school and effectively left school uh, at 16 years old, I believe. And what did you do for work during those younger years? I took any job that I could. I worked at my father's construction company, sometimes, um, you know, just administrative stuff. I mean, it was a small company, um, but I answered phones and I uh, worked at a, like a modeling agency that was also, you know, um, offered photography classes, makeup classes, hair, hair and makeup classes for people that were pursuing a career in entertainment. And I uh, started taking um, classes that I paid for by working there effectively as a trade. Uh, and I eventually worked there long enough to be able to pay for my headshots, which are the pictures that you use in the industry to promote yourself, you know, in, in whatever acting, modeling or both. Okay. And All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a great opportunity for us to look at baseline. We always say baseline matters and baseline in the, on the stand is better than baseline off the stand because you can see what's normal for the person under whatever level of duress that was. Her cadence is pretty fluid. It's interspersed with her using some ums and ahs, but those ums and ahs are as she goes from transition from one data point. When she's giving you a, a packet of data, that's pretty fluid. Then when she goes um, ah, um, ah, she's moving to something new. She does edit as she starts to say something where she says, thankful. I think she's going to praise herself and then rethinks that, redirects to a different way of saying it. We see her brow rise a lot, and we've seen her in past videos with grief, and her grief muscle, you know, that thing we usually see as an arch, is only a couple of small lines. Here we're seeing all straight lines across as she's doing requests for approval. And then she uses her mouth and withdraws her lips an awful lot, but she's not condemning, she's not saying anything negative. It's just the way she expresses a lot of what she's saying. I've watched her in other interviews. She does exactly that. When she's required to think about something, you'll watch your eyes out of focus. They're not making contact with anyone. She's going to an internal and she starts to think. She tries to say words down. She puts her brow down. And that's it, guys. I mean, this is her baseline. We're going to see she uses her illustrators. She even says the bit company was small. We see her hands illustrating what she's thinking. And so we expect to see that as she goes into the next piece. Scott, what do you got? All right. She looks and she sounds relaxed. She seems relaxed and she's wearing those dumpy little clothes like they're not little. They're a little bit big for her. Whereas before when she's when Johnny's been on uh, the stand, she's wearing these things that make her look a little bit more attractive. Not that she doesn't look attractive here, but her clothing is a little, the style is a lot different than it normally is. Her body language is smooth. It's not jerky. It's not stiff for the most part. Everything seems to be moving, not loping, but close to it because she's talked about this before. When she's asked, where did you go to school? And you can see her searching as her eyes dart back and forth for her answer. The one that she's prepared, she's gotten ready for it. 
And um, then she delivers it and it's fairly smooth. She's done. She's told that story since she got out of high school and for the last, you know, every, how many years that is. Um, but when she answers, she's looking right down the barrel at the jury. So that's who she's playing to. That's who she's acting to. And her answer is rehearsed, of course, but I don't think she went over it very many times, even though she's she's gone over it her whole life. And um, I'm sure her her focus was on what's coming up in the later videos. Mark, what, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so not only a baseline for us, but a framework for the jury to see her by. So the question from the examiner is, so what type of thing, and then she stops herself and then goes, so what did you, where did you go to school? It's where question, where did you go to school? If you ask me that question, I would say I went to Western Favel Upper School and it was just up the road about 15 from my home. That's where I went to school. But what she does with the question is to create not a geographical answer, she creates an evaluative answer answer. She says, I was a scholarship kid at a Catholic school. So she's first of all putting down not where she Catholic schools and many of them. But so that's not an answer to the question. She's setting up for the jury. Here's how I want you to see me as somebody who gets scholarships, who's somebody who goes to Catholic schools and goes to many Catholic schools. Why several, but, and then a look of disgust. So wrinkling of the nose and maybe a little bit of anger as well around that. Well, you know, maybe there's some issues with her changing schools. I don't quite know. Could be there, be interesting to investigate. She then goes on to talk about wealthier parts part of town other side of town. So she's on one side of the town, the schools are on another side, a wealthier side. Again, disdain, disgust, some snarls of aggression. Well, it's interesting, but but the this disdain and disgust and aggression kind of goes throughout a lot of her testimony. And again, I would say it's a bit of a baseline for her. There's a bit of a general baseline of a negativity, um, an unease with the world around her that could speak somewhat to a personality type there's been you know i think one or two people on the stand talking about her personality type and therefore or, or the ideas of a personality or some personality disorders with her i'm not going to go into any diagnosis of that i don't have the ability around that and there's some who say the person on the stand didn't have the abilities around that but there is a baseline body language there of a general let's just say unease or negativity about the world. Kind of interesting to see that. Oh, she, she has um, disdain, disgust, a little bit of aggression around administrative, answering phones, modeling agency. I mean, so you kind of go, well, does she dislike all of these things? Or is that just a general temperament that she has? I'm thinking probably a general baseline temperament of pain, negativity, stress, or certainly, let we might say she's not super positive in this particular situation maybe or maybe it's a general malaise with the world chase what do you think yeah i agree with you guys this is a great baseline development when greg greg is saying baseline what we mean is we're observing behaviors during circumstances where deception is not likely and that's what that's what we're looking at when we're seeing a baseline because we're not looking at like oh this body language means that and a lot of people think that that's what body language is but once you get to a good point we're not looking for individual body language we're looking for changes from baseline mostly and this is a solid baseline development which is bad news for amber as you're going to see here in a few minutes and her baseline is using an eyebrow flash for exposition or data revelation there's not a lot of hesitancy. There's a use of her hands, this one o'clock eye accessing movement. So her eyes move that way when she's accessing uh, some of these pieces of truthful data. And this is potentially a retreat position of her maybe moving away or running away. If I was seeing this first and I hadn't watched the trial before this, uh, that's what I might think, that the one o'clock is going to be the accessing forever. But that's going to change here in a bit. And I want you to watch for that and see if you can see it before we talk about it. See if you can spot that before we talk about it. When does she look away from one o'clock? There's even tone and cadence. 
And this chin boss, you, if you're a subscriber, you hear us talk about this pretty regularly. That means shame or grief, this muscle right here, it's called the chin boss. I think there's a more scientific name. I can't remember what it is. But she uses this muscle to accentuate a lot of points. So you saw it during all of this truthful exposition here while she's talking, that muscle's moving. So keep an eye out for that. At some points, the, the chin boss is completely gone and then shows up in a spike. That's where that makes sense for us to comment on. And that's where you're going to probably see a lot of us comment on the difference and change in baseline behavior. It's you know, get out of school as fast as I could. And I wanted to do, I wanted to do more things with my life than stay in Texas. So what types of things, so where did you go to school when you were um, younger? I was a scholarship kid at a Catholic school um, growing up, uh, several different Catholic schools, but they were always in the other, you know, on the other side of town in the wealthier part of town. And um, I, grew up quite um, working class and uh, and and thankfully with um, you know as long as I maintained an a average I, uh, I I enjoyed the benefit of a scholarship and I did that until I realized that I could take my GED and SATs early and I did that and placed out of school and effectively left school uh, at 16 years old I believe and what did you do for work during those younger years? I took any job that I could. I worked at my father's construction company, sometimes, um, you know, just administrative stuff. I mean, it was a small company, um, but I answered phones and I uh, worked at a, like a modeling agency that was also, you know, um, offered photography classes, makeup classes, hair, hair and makeup classes for people that were pursuing a career in entertainment. And I uh, started taking um, classes that I paid for by working there effectively as a trade. Uh, and I eventually worked there long enough to be able to pay for my headshots, which are the pictures that you use in the industry to promote yourself, you know, in, in whatever, acting, modeling, or both. Do you remember the first time that he physically hit you? Yes. Please tell the jury about it. <laughs> it was so, it's seemingly so stupid. So in, like insignificant. I will never forget it. It changed, it changed my life. I was sitting on the couch and we were talking, we were having a, like a normal conversation, you know, just, there was no fighting, no argument, nothing. And um, he was drinking and um, I didn't realize at the time, but I think he was using cocaine because it was like there was a jar, a jar of cocaine out on the table. I, re I realized that sounds weird, but it was like a, an actual vintage jar of it. But I didn't see him use it at the time, so I, I didn't really factor that in. I just, you know, he's drinking and we're talking and it's there's music playing and he's smoking cigarettes and we're sitting next to each other on the couch. And I ask him about the tattoo he has on his arm. And to me, it just looked like um, black marks. It, like, I didn't know, I didn't know what it said. It just looked like muddled, faded tattoo that was hard to read. And I said, what does it, what does it say? And he um, said, it says, why no, it says, why no? And I, um, I didn't see that. I thought he was joking uh, because it didn't look like it said that at all. And I laughed, it was that simple. Um, I, I just laughed because I thought he was joking and slapped me across the face and I laughed. I laugh because I, I didn't know what else to do. I thought this must be a joke. This must be a joke because I'm, I didn't know what was going on. I just stared at him kind of laughing still. Chase, what do you got? Well, first off, we've got hesitancy. 
which is outside of her baseline. There's a lot more hesitancy here. And hesitancy is one of those things we look for aside from deviation from baseline for deception. There's a retreat to internal dialogue. And when I say that, the eyes are moving this direction, which suggests that she's moving to internal dialogue. She's rehearsing something, going over something that's rehearsed. The facial expressions are more overplayed than I've ever seen in my entire life. And keep in mind, I've, I'm not just some dude on YouTube. I've been doing this for well over 30,000 hours uh, of my life uh, analyzing stuff like this. There's bottom teeth showing, which is outside of her baseline. And it suggests a little bit of anger and uh, uh, combativeness maybe. This chin boss movement you'll see here is pretty common. So I'm gonna ignore it most of the time unless there's an aberration. And she's aiming at the jury during all these critical points, making eye contact with multiple jurors, making sure to hit every single person there looking around the jury just during these critical points. During the points that a normal testimony, when it's emotional and life-changing, the person would be focused behind their eyes. They would be living in their head, reliving a situation. They'd be way less likely and I'm talking about likelihood, way less likely to be doing this, this kind of spraying eye contact around the jury. I think it's interesting after a year together, a year together at this point, and what she's talking about in the story, this jar of cocaine didn't magically appear. She had to be okay with it for a year until this point. There's a lot of disgust and, and contempt at Johnny and his tattoos on her face that you can see the disgust facial expression where everything kind of moves towards the middle, squeezes everything in the middle. There's some contempt, this one-sided smiling on her face and there's vanishing and reappearing sadness that is not characteristic of honest recall in my opinion. And every time her visual field gets close to Johnny, it just starts dragging towards Johnny. Her eyes flutter. So they, they start closing rapidly. And we do this unconsciously to not see something or to avoid something in a conversation. I think this is telling, as in other times when she's recalling things that are known facts, she has no problem looking at him whatsoever. So even stressful emotional stuff, she can look at him. And also, she's been with him a year at this point and is just now noticing these tattoos. A little bit strange. Scott, what do you got? All right. She looks a lot different, or she's acting a lot different body language-wise in this video than she did in the one before. She stiffens up some. Her movements are small and jerky here where last time they weren't. The downturned mouth, that indicates sadness. and uh, But the, the forehead doesn't engage the way it should for that, for that emotion. We don't see any grief muscle at all. We don't see anything else outside of that that shows us sadness. Her eyebrows are up. That's Greg's request for approval. That's... And that goes with that quite often. You'll see that as, as well. Her her cadence speeds up, which which means she's talking faster. Her tone is strong and her volume is actually louder. And um, she, we see a lot more engagement of the brow and the glabella muscles right in here. And when we talk about the grief muscle, what we're talking about is when the glabella and the brow muscle come together and they push up as the top of the forehead sort of comes down. It's really, really tough to do. Greg can do it with no problem. And that shows us an upside down horseshoe uh, shape in there. And that's what we refer to as uh, the grief muscle. So um, most of her illustrators are are made with her right hand. But then toward the end, where she gets a little bit more animated, she brings up her left hand and starts um, and she starts talking about the, the, the more graphic or more as it gets becomes more violent and she becomes more angry and more frustrated. And um, all of her illustrators are on point. They're timed correctly. There's no lag or rush between words or emphasizing with her eyebrows. All that stuff is spot on, but it's spot on and it feels a little bit odd. Now, most of the time in this, everything is as it should be. But something in my gut just says something's not right here. And I think most of the women watching this will say, will feel the same thing. And you'll feel that way because your brain, like I was saying earlier, is different than the female brain is different than the male brain. It gathers information a lot, a lot, gets a lot more detailed in the information and it sorts it differently than the male brain. We know that's, that's, the, that's a fact. So 
I think more women will see this and have their the women's intuition feeling of something's not right here. If you do feel that way, let us know in the comments if you feel that way. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? I'm going to focus during this on something I don't normally focus on with tenses. He said, I don't remember that I focus on that a great deal. Um, so I'm going to focus on historical present tense because there's a shift that she makes to historical present tense. She's talking about the past, but she goes into the tense language sense of it's happening now. She says, I ask him about the tattoo. This is what we call in drama an inciting incident because this is the thing that causes the cascade of other events to happen. And instead of saying, you know, I asked him about the tattoo, she says, I ask him about the tattoo. Now, why in drama is, especially in, in um, dangerous, around dangerous acts, <laughs> In drama or novels is going to historical present and useful. The storyteller, if you go to present tense, you survive the violence or not. But if you go to past tense and you're the storyteller, we know you survive. Or, of course, we know Amber Heard is there and we know she's, she's giving stories here about uh, violence and about the past but if she goes into uh, historical present tense there there is that sense of oh what happens next what happens next so look is she going and she'll do it she'll do this throughout by the way we'll see this come up a number of times the question becomes is she doing it be dramatic in the telling of a true story is she telling of a false story is it just a slip up you know is she just just moving tenses that happens that happens in culture that happens with certain um personalities as well or there's another option here and you need to keep your um i guess your mind open to these options if you've already gone one way or another on amber heard we do know that trauma does cause problems with storytelling we know that trauma causes problems with pronoun shift, and we know it causes problems with tense shift as well. So there is the option that there is real trauma here, and that is causing the tense uh, shift there. Um, I'll tell you a bit later on what one it seems to move towards more, but just think about those options as we go through, especially if you've already made up your mind. Because if you've already made up your mind, here's a great opportunity to open your mind to other ideas because it'll, other ideas won't ever change your mind. You know, if you've already made up your mind, it's made up. Nothing's going to, it's just an option here to do a bit of critical thinking, pay attention to other ideas that you're hearing there, and then go back to the idea that you already had, the mind that you'd already made up. So, uh, tense shift, we're gonna see a lot of that happening. Why is it happening? Uh, that's the big question. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so Scott, I'm gonna jump to, to Greg's intuition here. I'll tell you what you missed on here, what you feel. There's no illustrator for him slapping her, not one. She illustrates how small the company is, she does all that, but there's no illustrator of violence, there's nothing there. She starts off with that request for approval, talking to the jury. And then she does that disdain face, what we're all saying is kind of in her baseline where she draws all that lip withdrawal and all that. And she does just as much of that when she's talking about the tattoo as she does when she's talking about him slapping her. Well, hold on. Either one of those is more eventful than the other or not. And we're going to see a pattern that rejection and other things, we're gonna see a lot more animation in her than the actual violence, the fisticuffs or whatever you're going to hear in here. She goes into that storytelling with a lot of words and details, and she uses an elicitation technique. She does a provocative statement. A provocative statement is intended to get you to ask me a question. That's all it is. If I say it was a jar of cocaine, a whole jar, then you say, where did that come from? I'm getting you to pull part of the story out. And we use that when we're collecting intelligence because if I say something provocative and you ask a question, it starts the conversation. Then she, there's a really interesting piece in Chase you hit. She pauses and stammers when she's giving content and that's outside of her baseline. But who slapped her across the face? Slapped me across the face, not he, 
not Johnny, not anyone. Your vanishing perpetrator is just random. Somebody slapped her across the face. There's some uncertainty and throwaway facts or, um, or um, fading facts, as you would call them, Scott. And there's just nothing there. When she says, I laughed, there's a tongue jut, a pronounced tongue jut. And then she starts going down the well for emotion. That's, I don't see any of that as looking like a person who's been slapped around. And we'll see more of that as we go through, but I see less emotion about violence than I do about rejection or a tattoo or about the same amount. That's unusual when you're hearing something about violence from someone. That's all I got. Do you remember the first time that he physically hit you? Yes. Please tell the jury about it. <laughs> it was so, it's seemingly so stupid, so in, like insignificant. I will never forget it. It changed, it changed my life. I was sitting on the couch and we were talking, we were having a, like a normal conversation, you know, just, there was no fighting, no argument, nothing. And um, he was drinking and um, I didn't realize at the time, but I think he was using cocaine because it was like there was a jar, a jar of cocaine out on the table. I, re I realize that sounds weird, but it was like a, an actual vintage jar of it. But I didn't see him use it at the time, so I, I didn't really factor that in. I just, you know, he's drinking and we're talking and it's there's music playing and he's smoking cigarettes and we're sitting next to each other on the couch. And I ask him about the tattoo he has on his arm. And to me, it just looked like um, black marks. It, like I didn't know, I didn't know what it said. It just looked like muddled, faded tattoo that was hard to read. And I said, what, is it, what does it say? And he um, said, it says, why no? It says, why no? And I, um, I didn't see that. I thought he was joking uh, because it didn't look like it said that at all. And I laughed. It was that simple. Um, I, I just laughed because I thought he was joking and slapped me across the face. And I laughed. I laugh because I, I didn't know what else to do. I thought this must be a joke. This must be a joke because I'm, I didn't know what was going on. I just stared at him kind of laughing still thinking that he was going to start laughing too, to tell me it was a joke, but he didn't. He said, you think it's so funny. You think it's funny. You think you're a funny. And he slapped me again. Like, I wasn't clear. It wasn't a joke anymore. And I stopped laughing, but I didn't know what else to do. You know, you, I, 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 you, I didn't know what to do. You, you would think you, you would have a response, but I, as a woman, had never been hit like that. I'm an adult and I'm sitting next to the man I love and he slapped, he slapped me for no reason. It seemed like, and I missed the point. It was that stupid second slap. I know he's not kidding, but I don't know what else to say or do. So I just stared at him. I didn't say anything. I didn't react. I didn't move or freak out or defend myself or, or say, what are you doing? You're crazy. I just stared at him because I didn't know what else to do. And he slaps me one more time hard. I lose my balance. Um, at this point, we're sitting next to each other at the, on the edge of the couch, or I was on the edge of the couch. And I'm all of a sudden realizing that the worst thing has just happened to me that could possibly happen to you. I realize that I, I wish so much he had said he was joking. All right, well, I'll go first on this one. Uh, here's where she really stiffens up and her illustrators just disappear almost completely. If we remember from what Albert Ray talked about in his studies or went over as someone who's being honest and more likely to use more illustrators. These are illustrators, people emphasizing specific words or phrases. Now, although her voice gets louder, her cadence speeds up and her tone is just a little bit 
a little bit higher. And she's talking about something graphic and it's action packed, but we see almost zero, zero illustrators and gestures. Almost nothing, which is odd for her because in a little while she just blows up into to almost uh, one of those clowns, not clowns, but those balloon people you see in the parking lot that are just flowing everywhere. She's, she gets that big. <laughs> we know, but we, uh, let's see what else. In this, we're seeing all the right facial expressions. We're seeing anger, contempt, disgust, frustration, hopelessness, disagreement, and then one quick shot of happiness while she's talking about not freaking out. Uh, so this is loaded with everything we need to see from a body language perspective that shows the emotions are congruent with her story, with what she's talking about. Everything looks as it should. Um, but they're but they're so on point, they seem odd. They're too on point. That's what gives you that little that odd little feeling where you go, why is this? Why do I feel like or know like something's not right here? What's giving me that feeling on this? In each section of her story from paragraph to paragraph, paragraph you see facial expressions and they're huge. Like Chase was saying earlier, man, they're big. However, facial expressions don't go from one to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other, and, and change like that. They morph into the other ones. We're not seeing any morphing here. We're just seeing them change like little, like flipping switches on this because she knows now what to do for those uh, emotions, what, what facial expressions are supposed to be, or that we expect to see, that we usually see in those kind of things. One right after the other, just blocks, just sections, no morphing at all. So if you're getting that weird feeling about that, ladies, women, that's what I'm talking about. It's going to start feeling even worse. It's going to get even worse here in a few minutes. So keep watching for these throughout this video. When you see her, her expressions not morph, they just click from one to the other. Pay close attention to that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I remember we talked about a baseline about a year and a half ago. We covered her for a 2016 deposition. And all these lines indicate, just a straight line indicates in her that she's asking for approval. And then she has two lines, just two small lines when she's showing grief. You can go watch our other video and see it very clearly. This is the best resolution they had this one in. So this is what we get. Again, she's illustrating, yes, Scott, but she never illustrates the slap. There's never an impact. There's never that violence thing, which makes me think, why? Of all the things I would illustrate, it would be a draw or slap or something. She uses that transition language. Remember the ums and ahs as she's get, getting into the situation where she doesn't know what to say. She uses ums and ahs. Otherwise, she has slower cadence than she did in the beginning. And she does that same thing you pointed out last time, Scott. It's interesting. She has a request for approval and drawn down sides of the mouth. That's odd. We usually see grief and other emotion that's associated. It looks wrong. Then she, the only place I do see any real concern and grief and anger is when she said, I didn't move to defend myself. The illustrators are missing for these slaps. The illustrators are missing for everything else. But she's explaining the couch wonderfully with illustrators. She's taking her hands and showing you the real estate of where she's at. And she edits to tell you why she was able to be slapped off the couch. You can see, I got slapped, knocked off the couch. Well, how does that happen if you're sitting in the middle of a couch? She goes out of her way to say, well, we were sitting on the, well, no, I was sitting on the edge. Hmm, that seems like an edit you needed to make that if I slapped today, if I slapped Chase and he fell off the couch, after he shot me, he would say, Greg slapped me and I fell off the couch. He wouldn't say because I was sitting on the edge. That wouldn't be the way the story went. It's just not the way we go. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, well, so her story is, I lose balance. So it's not even, so again, she's back into that present past tense. There's a moment before that second slap. I know he's not kidding. Again, present past tense. Now, again, the question is, is, is it because there's deception going on? And yeah, there's a whole lack of illustrators there that we would expect to go with that. So you put that together, doesn't look good. But there is this idea that trauma, real trauma, will produce those tense uh, shifts. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind because you need to find clusters of information, not just one piece of information. If I go, look, based on this, uh, tense uh, change, clearly victim of trauma. Well, maybe, maybe. It's possible. Uh, look, lack of uh, illustrators, clearly a liar. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe. we don't know. We've got to put the whole thing together and we've got a whole bunch more videos to go. So if you made up your mind, suspend for a little bit, you may well find out that you were 
absolutely right, according to us by the end, or maybe there'll be something new that'll come out of it for you. Um, what is interesting for me is there is a very difference a uh, very big difference in her voice and fading facts, as Scott says. So fading facts is when stuff just kind of uh, uh, just peters out at the end like that. And that is often a sense of somebody not being confident, let's say, in their answer. Many reasons why somebody might not be confident, but we find it shows up quite a bit with deception. Anyway, she does that on... Um, uh, what she wasn't saying. So she says, you know, what I didn't say, say was, what are you doing? You're crazy. She doesn't even finish that word. Now, at the same time, she's telling us what she didn't say. So maybe the fading facts work in that. Maybe the tone shift works in that. But on its own, well, we need to put it with a whole bunch of different factors there. Uh, another factor to bring in, I, as a woman, have never been hit like that. I, as a woman, so she's very clear about that, have never been hit like that. Well, does that mean as a man, that's okay? Like, men hit other men like that, but as a woman, that's not expected. So there's some real clear clarity around uh, an expectation of what should happen around men and women. I, I would say the same, uh, some good kind of chin boss action there, uh, some good lips, lip compression, some good sadness in some of the right places. But my worry is still around this tense shift because even now I'm starting to go, well, when's she gonna do it when she's not, when is she not gonna do it? What is the pattern of tense shift here? And it's gonna start for me to get even more chaotic and even more difficult to really work out when I think it's gonna show up and when it's not gonna show up. So wait for that. Uh, Chase, what do you think? Totally agree. And this tense shifting is actually going to get predictable in, in a few minutes. It's going to come up during very specific times uh, in a minute because she's getting more used to it. And I think this uh, present tense, when the, there's a shift to present tense, it's shifting to the screenplay. I do this. I do this. I experience this. There's a screenplay going on there. And this downward turn mouth with the raised eyebrows is the traditional clown face and sharing, wanting to share that grief or share that experience and getting somebody else to share some kind of emotion. And she's layering in truth and deception here. There's more vanishing perpetrator, slap me in the face. It's Really strange. The first slap is past tense. The second slap is present tense. Then there's a shift to past tense again uh, when she's uh, discussing how she felt about it. Then she goes back to present tense for the third slap, then back to past tense for her reaction to that slap. Then we go back to present tense for realizing the worst thing has just happened to me. Then there's a shift to past perfect. I wished so much he had said he was joking. And this is a major problem. I have been doing this a long time. I've analyzed a bunch of videos. I've never seen this much tense shifting in my lifetime. On record, I'm saying it here. I've never seen anything like this. Past, present, past, present, over and over like this. And then facial expression shifting rapidly between emotions. I've never seen anything like this in my life. So I would... Uh, I would bet that there is a very, very high likelihood of deception here in the story. That's all I've got. I'm going to bet that this trying to grow a mustache thing is probably the worst decision I've made in the last 15 years. It's going to be no, the major amount shift of to present tense for that. <laughs> it's the worst decision you're making. I, I think what you should yeah. do is go put on one of those filters so it'll look yeah, like take it's it off part of the filter. filter. <laughs> That's what I'll do when we come back. I'll have that on for a few minutes. <laughs> Yeah. No one will know. They'll know. <laughs> yeah, they'll know. <laughs> Thinking that he was going to start laughing, too, to tell me it was a joke. But he didn't. He said, you think it's so funny. You think it's funny. You think you're a funny. And he slapped me again. 
like, it was clear. It wasn't a joke anymore. And I stopped laughing, but I didn't know what else to do. You know, you, I, 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 you, I didn't know what to do. You, you would think you, you would have a response, but I, as a woman, had never been hit like that. I'm an adult and I'm sitting next to the man I love and he slapped, he slapped me for no reason. It seemed like, and I missed the point. It was that stupid second slap. I know he's not kidding, but I don't know what else to say or do. So I just stared at him. I didn't say anything. I didn't react. I didn't move or freak out or defend myself or, or say, what are you doing? You're crazy. I just stared at him because I didn't know what else to do. And he slaps me one more time hard. I lose my balance. Um, at this point, we're sitting next to each other at the, on the edge of the couch, or I was on the edge of the couch. And I'm all of a sudden realizing that the worst thing has just happened to me that could possibly happen to you. I realize that I, I wish so much he had said he was joking. Could you Tell the jury what the box is that has the property with the skull bones property of JD. Um, that's Johnny's um, drug box. I've seen it used for pills, but at the time it was um, bags of Coke, like okay. dime ba bags of Coke. Okay. And what are these white lines on the table to the left of that box? That is cocaine. Okay. Um, and do you know what is in these two glasses that have kind of a gold colored, colored liquor? Uh, yes, they're different, actually. It's confusing. They're different, um, different liquids. Uh, the one in the back in the larger glass is, um, I, I believe at the time I um, was doing these tabs, or Barocca, that's what they're called. They're little tablets. And um, anyway. Uh, I remember at the time that that's what I was putting in my water because I had just come back from France where they sell them. And then the brown liquid in the shot glass is um, Johnny's liquor. I don't know what it's called, but it, we kept it in the freezer at the time. It was bef bef you know, at that time, March 2013, I hadn't, you know, um, I still didn't have the, you know, hard line. I won't even keep that you know, in my freezer sort of attitude or posture with him. I wasn't that bold at the time, you know, I didn't like it, but I didn't have that strength. I kind of, at that time, I think was doing things like trying to pour it out when I could. Right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it's really going to start falling to bits there. It's tricky to watch this one because it really does descend quite quickly. Starts off with, I believe that's not very forceful. Uh, she believes that it was the tabs of, I think she says, Barocca. I've never heard of that drink, but I, I guess it's little tabs that create some kind of juice or drink or something. They come from Paris, apparently. Um, she doesn't really need to tell us any of that. I mean, she's worried this will be quite confusing to us because to an observer, what you'll see there is two glasses, apparently one is a shot glass. And, and I understand there's some foreshortening there and one glass will look a little bit bigger than one. But even so, even so, to an observer like myself, I've, I've seen a few glasses, and to an observer like myself, they look a fairly similar size. It looks like both people are drinking pretty much. I mean, I know it can be confusing. She's told me it can be confusing, okay? And she took me through how you go to Paris and you get stuff, and, and you know, it kind of went on and on. That I, I stopped listening to a lot of it at, at one point because it didn't seem pertinent, but clearly it is pertinent that we need to understand that sh she's not having a drink. Yeah, that's what we need to understand, that he's got a shot glass and it's got Johnny's liquor in it. If, I, if I'd been with, with somebody for a while, I'd, I'd probably know what the liquor is. You know, I'd probably know, though it's kept in the freezer or the fridge or whatever it is, I'd probably have a good idea what it is because I'd be a drinker as well, like her. She has a drink now and again. You know, it, you know I, I, actually, from what I've heard, you know, she, she has a few now and again. That's okay. I've got no judgment about that. But it would be easier to say, so Johnny and I were both 
having a drink, okay? But that's not what comes across here. Johnny's got a shot glass and it's got Johnny's liquor in and she's got something from Paris, something completely different. Um, she, she, though she, she says, look, that's his drugs um, tin and it's got uh, Coke in it, dime bags of Coke. And what are those, those lines? Well, they're cocaine. And um, there's four of them. Well, either Johnny sets it up for his four nostrils or Johnny sets it up to do a couple of lines and then very quickly a couple of others. And, and those are all possible. Or Amber's taking Coke as well. And that would be OK because, you know, when you're partners, you tend to kind of do some of the same stuff. You have a drink together. If you do Coke, you're probably going to do some Coke drugs together. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, as it descends into more drugs, you might you might calm it down a little bit or invite some people around to be a little more social, to take the edge, to, for there to be some more social responsibility when people start getting a little bit off their tree. Because if there's no social responsibility going on and you're, you know, off your tree a little bit, then it can all go a bit, <coughs> a bit wild. But anyway, uh, I, I've, th at this point, I don't buy this story at all. I don't buy it at all. It's not a good description of what's going on. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Sense. There's too much overemphasis on trying to tell me the details, so I don't buy it. Look, for anybody who's into just lobbing in a really great conspiracy theory here as, as well, just because you may as well, you may as well have some fun. Um, if you want a great conspiracy theory, uh, you could say it's all been set up in a Masonic hall. Have a look. Have a look at that photograph <laughs> and tell me why they set up the evidence in a Masonic hall. And send, send the money, please. Freemasons, please send me the money. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so Mark, I think the reason we know something is going on is because she dramatically shifts baseline. First of all, that she starts to separate herself from Johnny, Johnny the monster. Now, this is like you said, early on in their relationship, but she's separating herself from him. At the end of her description of what this is, she does some eye blocking and some requests for approval and a lip compression. She has a condemning face at cocaine she does maybe she's afraid of the perception of something that will happen because there's something hidden in there because her transition is much too rapid more more than normal to your guys point earlier then she starts rambling to make herself appear to be somebody else that's out of baseline she starts to give you too much detail well, I bought these in france and this is a thing that people do in france and and, and. well i don't care about what they do in france what's in those things one is a bottle of some kind of drink non-alcoholic and the other is alcohol then as she shifts gears to start to make herself a better person and to do some social signaling or, or some kind of um, as she starts to virtue signal and say, look, I'm not the one. She starts this thing of, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. I don't know how many times it happens. Chase, you may have counted. I think it's five or six in a sentence or two. And she's never done that before. So there's some way she's trying to distance and it makes her uncomfortable and it's filler for her. So immediately I would jump on that and say, oh, hold on. What do you mean? And I would start taking that story apart. That stumbling over words and using filler words is there for a reason. Uh, Scott, what do you got? Or, sorry, Chase, what do you got? Oh. <laughs> so here's a quick tip. If someone's telling you a story, process it through this lens. What is being concealed in that story? And in this instance, every flaw every bad behavior, every possible hint at ever having made a mistake in her lifetime is absent. She's giving us a story of a flawless Disney princess who lived with Satan. And Baraka, just as a quick tip here, is like airborne in the US. It's like an immunity support effervescent. Uh, I have some in my kitchen actually that dissolve in, in water like an Alka-Seltzer. I'm pretty fancy if you didn't know. I have Baraka here, but there's sure, a large Baraka. <laughs> <laughs> there's a large spike in uncertain language toward the end of her statement. This is the beginning of our discovery of her stress and deception baseline. So this is the big spike in what we're really looking for as interrogators and behavior profilers. Scott, what all right. Got? The attorney says, uh, tell the jury what's in the box. And she tells the attorney what's in the box. And she goes into detail about it. Not once does she look at the jury during that. However, when she gets to the part where she starts talking about her vitamin energy water, which is, you're right, I had to Google it. I didn't know what Baraka or Baraka was, whatever it was. 
it's a it's a multivitamin as you know and it, it gives gives her energy and it's a health food that's the way the way they see that also she's coming on like she doesn't think alcohol is good she sounds like oh that that's alcohol and she doesn't and like mark was saying she doesn't know what's in it really if you're if she's gonna say well, hey man what is that at least if she's been if she's dating the guy or married to him at this point you're gonna know what's in there uh, and she acts like it's bad she didn't want to tell him that that she want to keep it in her freezer come on man and then she's sitting there next to the damn scarface with all that blow lined out on her on the table and she's coming on like i, I don't know what uh, you know i'm drinking healthy water you don't know what he's drinking and I, that's all i got because i i just i can't go any further than that could you tell the jury what the box is that has the property with the skull bones property of jd um that's johnny's um drug box i've seen it used for pills but at the time it was um bags of coke like okay. dime ba bags of coke okay and what are these white lines on the table to the left of that box that is cocaine okay um and do you know what is in these two glasses that have kind of a gold colored colored liquor uh yes they're different actually it's confusing they're different um different liquids. Uh, the one in the back in the larger glass is, um, I, I believe at the time I um, was doing these tabs, or Barocca, that's what they're called. They're little tablets. And um, anyway, uh, I remember at the time that that's what I was putting in my water because I had just come back from France where they sell them. And then the brown liquid in the shot glass is um, Johnny's liquor. I don't know what it's called but it, we kept it in the freezer at the time it was bef, bef, you know at that time march 2013 i hadn't you know um i still didn't have the you know hard line i won't even keep that you know in my freezer sort of attitude or posture with him i wasn't that bold at the time you know i didn't like it but i didn't have that strength i kind of at that time i think was doing things like trying to pour it out when I could. And Johnny, in uh, I don't remember the words he used, but starts accusing me of kind of like telling on him and calling him, um, uh, you know, a drunk in front of his kids. I hadn't, I hadn't done that. I was actually trying to protect Johnny. Uh, I wasn't, it didn't feel like my place at all to share that with, with, his daughter or, or anyone um, at the time other than adults who might help with it, but not his kids. So I was trying to tell him, I'm, I, I was just trying to comfort her. I was trying to protect you. He uh, basically was accusing me of doing this thing and of, of making them aware of his, uh, that he was drinking again. And he slams me up against the, the sidewall of the bedroom of the, we were in the bedroom this whole time, but up against the wall of the cabin and slams me up by my neck and holds me there for a second and tells me that he, he could fucking kill me. And that was an embarrassment. I was embarrassing, it was an embarrassment. This whole thing was a joke, it was all embarrassment. I made him feel sick and I'll, ne I'll never forget I'm, 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 I was very, very, very much in love with this whole family now. And he's saying I'm embarrassing to him. And that somehow stuck in, in, in me more than the, I could fucking kill you. It just sounded like hyperbole. It sounded like something he was just saying, but the, the names that he was calling me kind of just pushing me up against the wall by my neck, you know, I, it hurt, it hurt my feelings, it hurt. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is another one of those trigger situations. Something is going on in her head that equates him saying that you disappoint me, that I don't like you with violence. I mean, at this point, she says he grabbed me by the neck and she actually holds her hand up in the right way. First illustration of violence we've seen. Then later she goes, he pushed my neck, don't know, or my throat, don't know which of those is 
the accurate piece. Did he push her? Did he hold her up? Don't know. But based on what she's saying, he slammed her up against the wall, but he said bad things to her when he did it. And the bad things that he said to her are ego damaging. And that seems to be a volatility thing because she's showing a lot more emphatic emotion about that issue of being told that he was disappointed in her than she is about any physical violence. So I want to watch really closely now and say, what's causing this? Is this a trigger event for her in some way that triggers something in her head? And guys, not saying it didn't happen, but there's a lot of odd body language and a lot of shift in her cadence. Remember, in her baseline, concise packets of information about issues was normal for her with stammers as you transition. She stammers in the concise packet of information here. So it makes me want to go, hold on a second. You changed. Why did you change? Chase, what do you got? Yeah. During that concise packet, there's a, I don't remember, starts. And we don't say starts. If something's happening to me, I'm not going to say Greg started choking me. I'm going to say Greg choked me. Like kind of a, a hesitancy again, and then two more us, and then more hesitancy. That's all within this statement here. There's a shift to present tense only for the abuse. And I think the embarrassment story is truthful here. The abuse shows a very high, in my opinion, very, very high likelihood of deception. Talking in the above 95%. And she's unable to look at Johnny until she talks about it hurting her feelings. And that's when she does that. Uh, when he told her that she was an embarrassment, which I think probably happened. And the deviation in baseline is only around the abuse and not around the mean comments and how those comments made her feel. Scott? Yeah, once again, it's I'm good and 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 he's bad. And she's portraying herself as the protector here. She's protecting her, the monster's children from the monster at this point. So go, going back to, to Mark's original thing, it's it's good versus evil in this case. And she's good and, and Johnny Depp is evil. Uh, and it sounds like a high school student who's been in trouble and been sent to the office. That's exactly she talks about uh, protecting people. And then she would have she wouldn't have said that around uh, little children, but she would have she would have said it around adults who could help. So this this is getting out. This is where well, I think it's out of her about to get out of hand for here in a couple minutes. And she's performing this whole thing for the jury and she wants to make sure she's doing well. So she looks over at the attorney as she's given these things. It's, that's when she, because the attorney knows the story she's supposed to be telling. She's familiar with it. Her gestures are, and illustrators are in line with what, what we've seen so far. And she relay, relays on her right hand, relies on her right hand for most of the action in this almost completely. And, and during this mixed truth, because I agree, I think, I think, Part of it's true and part of it's it's not true. Um, it, I think some of this happened, but it wasn't quite as dramatic as she said, you know, if any of it did. And she's blown a big story up out of it. Um, and once again, the situation we're hearing hearing that about that doesn't manifest are the physical, the body language cues and tells that let us know she's experiencing the emotions she says she says she's experiencing. What she says is happening. She's not, doesn't look like she's, she's experiencing the right stuff from what her body language says. There's no grief muscle again. Overall, her gestures and illustrators are too smooth and too calm, and none of them hang. When, it, when an illustrator hangs, when someone's talking, and the illustrator hangs there for a minute, they're thinking. They're up in their head. I saw Bigfoot, and he came out of the woods, and then this. So you'll see that happen. But in this case, they do hang in a minute. But they, you should see a little bit of, of pause in there, a little bit of hanging in there, and you don't see any of it at all, except for in a couple of minutes, and, and I'll explain that when we get there. Um, having said all that, um, she calms down a little bit. She gets her voice gets a little bit calmer. Things get a little bit more smooth, and then um, I, I, I think what we're seeing her, her explain, along with his body language, I think part of it happened, part of it didn't, and I think she's making what did happen. A lot more dramatic than it, than it was. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think if you wanted to bias towards her being a victim of victim of violence here, you would say, hey, she really starts to produce illustrators here. Uh, and I hear what you're saying, Scott, around they may not be quite right, but I'm going to bias towards in this particular case. Okay, victim here, illustrators, she's passionate about it, slams me up 
tells me, goes to the uh, present tense there, which there are good examples of people uh, who, um, uh, under these abusive situations, go to present tense there. However, contrary to that, you could go, well, she's being illustrative because she knows this is where the passion has to come out. And this is where the violence happens. So I really got to sell this here. So that's why the illustrators come out. And that's why they might look a little bit odd because they're more produced. And you could go, well, she goes to present tense because she knows the dramatic nature of that. And as an audience, when we're hearing that, we'll go, what happens? Will she get out of it? You know, uh, it's more exciting for us. But here's what I can say for sure, is that the idea of embarrassed, embarrassing, embarrassment, embarrassing, uh, all of those are used. And, and so there's huge layers, <coughs> excuse me, of that word. The embarrassment and in being embarrassing and somebody being embarrassed is the biggest part of this story. And then when she goes back to the violence and says, it hurt, it hurt my feelings, have a listen to which hurt has the most stress on it. The first hurt, it hurt, has a little bit of fading fact on there, which is Scott's idea of it just kind of peters out, maybe not as confident, therefore maybe not as honest potentially. And then it hurt, it hurt my feelings, there's a lot of stress on that. So here's what I'm going to say is most likely very accurate about that. There was a lot of embarrassment around this or feelings of embarrassment. And embarrassment is very, very important to feel to the feeling of you've done the wrong thing. You've you look bad in front of people and people don't think good of you. That's incredibly important. And that hurt is the most important hurt given whether there's physical hurt going on at the same time or not, that's the really important hurt. Now, which is it? Is it both? Is it physical hurt and mental hurt? Is it one or the other? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I got, I got some good suspicions, but uh, I won't say at this point. But certainly the hurt of embarrassment is, is a, acutely important and painful here. And Johnny... In uh, I don't remember the word he used, but starts accusing me of kind of like telling on him and calling him, um, uh, you know, a drunk in front of his kids. I hadn't I hadn't done that. I was actually trying to protect Johnny. Uh, I wasn't. It didn't feel like my place at all to share that with with his daughter or, or anyone. Um, at the time other than adults who might help with it, but not his kids. So I was trying to tell him, I'm, I, I was just trying to comfort her. I was trying to protect you. He uh, basically was accusing me of doing this thing and of, of making them aware of his, uh, that he was drinking again. And he slams me up against the, the sidewall of the bedroom of the ca we were in the bedroom this whole time but up against the wall of the cabin and slams me up by my neck and holds me there for a second and tells me that he he could fucking kill me and that was an embarrassment i was embarrassing it was an embarrassment this whole thing was a joke it was all embarrassment i made him feel sick and i'll, ne I'll never forget I'm, 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 I was I'm very, very, very much in love with this whole family now. And he's saying I'm embarrassing to him. And that somehow stuck in, in, in me more than the, I could fucking kill you. It just sounded like hyperbole. It sounded like something he was just saying, but the, the names that he was calling me well, kind of just pushing me up against the wall by my neck, you know, I, it hurt, it hurt my feelings, it hurt. And at some point, um, he drinks in front of me at first, I think it was like a Malbec or a wine or something. 
And I remember we hadn't, like, it's that it kind of started the art, an argument. And that was upstairs in that room that we just looked uh, at a picture of, you know, by the sunflowers. That's more or less where we were standing, just closer to the kitchen. And we get in an argument and I shove past him, just stomp off. And he grabs me. And we have an argument about me walking away and am I walking out of this? And in my head, I was like, I, I would, I actually wasn't thinking of leaving yet, but that would later be going through my mind. We had a, a, a brief interaction and I don't, I don't remember the exact sequence of things. I wish I did. I have a lot of flashes. It gets a little bit more confusing from my ability to recall everything in a linear way a little later on as things got crazier. But for this part, the first night, what I distinctly remember is at one point, I, 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 I don't think I had gotten very far, or maybe I came back into the room, but he, when he shoved me, I went flying across these parakeet floors. I mean, just skidding across these floors. And I remember thinking it just looked so easy for him to throw me around like that, you know? I, I, it, it, I, I just slid. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, so now let's pay attention to the word remember. We've heard it peppered in and out here so far through these videos, just a little bit here, a little bit there, and now we're going to be listening for it. And let's listen for the things described and how she describes things when she uses the word remember. Not a whole lot here, just a couple of times, but coming up, we're going to see it go crazy with that word. When we hear that word, she's looking right at the jury most of the time. I remember. Pay attention to that too. So we're beginning to see her body language change here as she becomes more animated. There are words and phrases that she uses as and, and gestures she uses energy-wise to get things up and get, get things happening. She's starting to get these things. She's got to get it rolling because there's a lot coming up here in a couple of minutes. It's supposedly to get very supposed to get very graphic here. However, things are as they should be at this point. Everything looks pretty much the way it should it should be. Everything is congruent. Her Illustrators are on point. Everything energy wise is where it should be and everything is working together. Everything she's, she's got this one going very well. Everything looks good. So let's talk about PTSD just for a second. I'm not an expert on it at all, but I know about it. I've read about it. I think I have a basic understanding of it. And I think she's trying to make it sound like she has PTSD because she's what she's done is she's been told to or she's read about it. And, and said, here's what PTSD is. And we're going to mix this in here to make it sound like this guy's giving you that from the way he's acting towards you. Like I said at the beginning, people have this from situations like this. We know that. I'm just telling you what we're seeing or what I'm seeing in this video here. That's why I'm going with this. When she talks about having flashes and scenes about what happened and loss of memory, those go right down the, down the line for PS, uh, PTSD. Also, when she says she can't remember things in a linear way, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Look at this haircut and this bad mustache and these glasses. But I'm smart enough to know when somebody has heard something and they're parroting it. One of my favorite things in the world to pay attention to is sentence structure and, the, and how someone set, structures a thought or an idea as they start going through trying to relay that idea to you. As she's doing this, she knows she has to throw in that word linear somewhere. And you don't say in a linear way, you say in a linear fashion. That's the way it's properly used. I don't think she's, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying she's an idiot or anything like that, but I can tell you when somebody reads a lot. And again, I can tell you when somebody's parroting something they've heard. There was, Greg and I were in Louisville talking to some, some people at, at, a, at the, um, a neurological department there as we we're going to do some studies. And I can tell you pretty much after talking to somebody for 15 or 20 minutes, what they're reading or what kind of, of, of reading they're into or what they're, what they like to, to pay attention to, what they like to read about. And I nailed this one guy on philosophy all the way down to his author, who he had just been reading by just talking to him for a few minutes. It's sort of a parlor trick, and I, I can teach anybody how to do it. And in this, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing in her talking, she doesn't read a whole lot. She's going to say she reads a whole lot, but she doesn't because her sentence structure is that of the of, of a high school students almost when she starts talking and starts describing things. The structure to it 
my structure, when I talk, I talk really, really fast. And it's really hard to understand me sometimes because I'm trying to get all the information out that I can. Having said that, I do pay attention to when people structure their senses when they're creating an idea and how to do that. She's gotten information. She's been reading over it the day before that or that day, and she's remembering these things she's supposed to say about the flashes, about remembering scenes and, and not remembering things in a linear way when it should be linear fashion. That's what we're hearing here. That's what's happening here. So I'm not saying she doesn't have PTSD, but I'm saying she's acting like she has it and she's trying to pretend like she doesn't know what it is and that these things are part of PTSD. That's what I think is going on there. Chase, what do you got? I tend to agree. <clears throat> if somebody reads this book, this is the book that you diagnose mental disorders with. It's got all the every possible disorder you can think of. And then they fake having a disorder. That's a whole different thing. And it's a huge accusation. This is just my opinion. That's called malingering. I did uh, two years of study on this, and this was my textbook, The Clinical Assessment of Malingering and Deception. And it's made for court trials and depositions, surprisingly. In this, we see a lot of these indicators, exactly what Scott was just talking about. And I don't think you've been through that class. But you know exactly there's the standardized behavior for that kind of thing. And we're seeing it here in this video. So my, the first thing I had in my notes here was start paying attention to every time she says, remember here. And let's talk about a few red flags that are, are present here. There's drinks in front of me, present tense. I remember there's an argument in past tense. We, we get in an argument. He grabs me, present tense. Uh, we had a brief interaction. There's hiding time and past tense shifting there. What I distinctly remember, we're hearing that word again, and it came up right when the physical thing started happening. And what I remember, again, slid across the floor. Then there's hesitancy. Then there's distancing language. Then there's an eye flutter, but only at the points of abuse. The eye fluttering where there's a rapid closure of the eye when we want to get rid of a thought we see that there, but we also see it during periods of deception. So the accuracy of her memory is a little bit flawed, but becomes somehow superhuman, 100% accurate when recalling only times of abuse. And this is clinically written here in the, in the forensic interrogation methods and the forensic psychology methods of detecting this kind of stuff. <clears throat> Maybe I'm no expert. But there's a sharp movement into internal dialogue at the exact moment that she's recalling the physical altercation, a physical event. She's moved, her eyes moved down here. I was not a huge believer until Greg actually convinced me of this, that you ask somebody to recall something or to rehearse a line in their head, and they'll move down that direction. Uh, she narrates her sliding across the floor in third person with her hand, and it has done every single other demonstration. I've watched every interview that she's done. I, I did this for 10 hours yesterday in first person up to this point, with the exception of the comments regarding the abuse. So everything is in first person as she's experiencing it until the abuse starts being brought forward. And then she's narrating in third person, like she's showing you something from a movie or a screenplay. That was a lot. I apologize. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, yeah. So, so let me get this right, Chase. If I was kind of acting the part of somebody with PTSD, I could take a look at some of those manuals and books and kind of look at some of the behaviours that happen and kind of perform those behaviours. And I might stand a chance of looking to, to the layperson something like a ju jury or something like that, because they're, they're meant to be, there should be no experts in there. They should be just kind of ordinary people uh, just looking at it. I might be able to come across as having experienced trauma. And, and if I was doing that kind of research as an actor, I might have come across just by Googling, Googling around um, a study that says that people who've experienced trauma and have PTSD do a lot of tense shift when they talk about uh, the violence 
being perpetrated. And so I might start doing that. I might. I might start doing that. But if but if I did start doing that and I'm I'm an actor, I, I might kind of slip up now and again and get it wrong because I'm having to make it up as I go along because I haven't been written a script, because you hope as an actor that you get really good writers and they, they do all the research and they write you really good scripts and then it's all kind of accurate. And then people, you know, give you an award, they give you an Oscar because they go, ah, you know, that was really good. You were just like somebody with PTSD and you kind of, you take the award and what you don't say is, yeah, they, they wrote it really well. It was just, it was just me you know, imagining the situation, saying the words that somebody else wrote, just looked like I, I was I was that, I wasn't. Anyway, because um, that might be happening here. That could, I'm not saying it is, but it could be happening there because she says, um, well, she says, I shove past him, just stamp off. She goes into that present tense. So she's okay about putting her own aggression in present tense as well. And so that's probably a good thing if she puts all aggression in the same tense, that's probably okay. Um, I'm with you on that. I don't recall. I wish I did. And then she says, what I distinctly remember. Well, sorry, you can't have both. You can't have, well, I mean, but maybe you can. Maybe you can. With If you've looked at PTSD, maybe you can, can have both things. You can go, and especially if you're kind of getting that idea across to an audience of some sort, they might forgive you just a little bit more. Okay, if you if you're if you put yourself across, it's just flashes. It's just you know, imagine it's just flashes that happen. So I wish I could recall that thing. Uh, I can recall this thing really, really well. By the way, well, after she says what I distinctly remember, we get a lip lick to the side of the mouth, which is totally off baseline. We haven't seen that from her before. Um, feels to me like that's that stress. Uh, I don't think, she says, I don't think I had got very far. Maybe I had got back to the room. Hang on. I shove past him, just stomp off. And now what she distinctly remembers is, I don't think I'd got very far. Maybe I'd got back in the room. Okay, so how, so how did that happen? Because when I, when I shove past somebody and stomp, stomp off, like I'm gone. Like I'm not coming back again. I'm gone, but she's back in there, and we don't know how. And But when he shoved me, okay, hang on, now we've gone to past tense. This isn't making any sense, because that should be in present tense. So that so now I'm I now I'm totally confused. But I guess you know if you've had trauma and PTSD, then uh, you know all bets are off. I guess I guess it's a bit of a bit of a scramble. Uh, I went flying across the parquet floor. I think she says parakeet floor, but it's parquet. It's a parquet floor. Um, so there's a there's a, he, he, there's shoves and there's th throws. I don't know what it is, whether it's a shove or a throw. It probably can't be both. So maybe you want to pick one of them. It looked so easy. It looked so easy. Well, I think you said this, Chase, but that's the wrong angle now. That's it. Can't have looked so easy. It would be if somebody shoves me across a parquet floor and I slide across it. Yeah. I would say it was so easy for that person to shove me. I wouldn't be the external camera angle, you know, doing a nice slow pan around that. This one's a dog's dinner. It's a complete mess. It's all fallen to bits around this. And I think if there is an act going on here, and I think we've got some good ideas that there, there could be, there could be, it's, it's not being sustained very well, unfortunately. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, so everything we're saying is our opinion. In my opinion, she's done some homework here. That sounds like a checklist. Hey, let's see. Got that? Yep, got it. Ooh, nope, yep, got that. Got that too. I've been around a lot of people with PTSD, and it can happen to a person from something very minor. It can. And other people, it may take something horrendous to give them PTSD. If you're a rage-filled person and you do something rageful, you can't keep things together in order either. So I'll just leave it at that. That's my opinion there. But let's hit a couple of things. Remember, I told you she does a lot of that weird face, condemning face, just to punctuate. She does it here the same for the room with the sunflowers as she does for this argument. So that's just telling you that's just the way she punctuates. Doesn't mean that something really happened. Words, however, really matter. And she says, shove past him, strong shove, stomp off, with an emphatic lower jaw when she does it. There's a lot of emotional eye accessing there. And then she gets to that thing where she says, we had a brief interaction and she actually shows disgust and a tongue jut. 
something's up right here. I'm going to also give you two things to watch from here on. I think she's done her homework. She does a one shoulder shift as she illustrates with the other hand when she says, maybe I was in the room, maybe I wasn't, because I think she's in some heated moment here. And so putting that story together is a little tough. She does more illustration at sliding across the floor than she does at being hit or shoved. And she does more illustration at shoving and sliding across the floor than she does at fists and at slapping. Start paying attention to that. It makes me think that the further she has to reach to give you harsh details, the less likely she is to be illustrative for it. Could that be a result of PTSD? Don't know. Never seen anybody that was that way, but it comes out in different ways than all people. This just makes me suspicious. I'll leave it at that. And at some point, um, he drinks in front of me at first. I think it was like a Malbec or a wine or something. And I remember we hadn't, like, it's that it kind of started the art, an argument. And that was upstairs in that room that we just looked uh, at a picture of, you know, by the sunflowers. That's more or less where we were standing, just closer to the kitchen. And we get in an argument, and I shove past him, just stomp off. And he grabs me, and we have an argument about, me walking away and am I walking out of this? And in my head, I was like, I, I would, I actually wasn't thinking of leaving yet, but that would later be going through my mind. And we had a, a, a brief interaction and I don't, I don't remember the exact sequence of things. I wish I did. I have a lot of flashes that, it gets a little bit more confusing from my ability to recall everything in a linear way a little later on as things got crazier. But for this part, the first night, what I distinctly remember is at one point, I, 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 I don't think I had gotten very far, or maybe I came back into the room, but he, when he shoved me, I went flying across these parakeet floors. I mean, just skidding. Shh across these floors. And I remember thinking it just looked so easy for him to throw me around like that, you know? I, I, it, it, I, I, I just slid. I remember eventually in this interaction, he shoves me up against the fridge. Uh, he has me by the throat and he just was holding me there by my throat. And I wondered if the, if it was the drugs, I wondered if it was him. It hadn't, in my recollection, hadn't been that long. He has me up against the throat. He's kind of bashing me against the, the wall next to the fridge. We're kind of moving in that area. And at some point I'm in his face. And he had, he, I don't know if he had let go of my neck or loosened my grip, but I remember slapping him across the face, screaming at him, screaming at me. I got my hand free when, I, when he tried to grab me when I walked off. I stormed off, I slammed the door upstairs. I don't know if it was in that instance or if it was in a later one that I eventually barricaded the, the door. Um, you know, I, I couldn't, it wouldn't stop him from coming in. He could come in the other doors. You know, there's plenty of, there's a back door, there's a patio, but at least I'd hear it. And my, this is March, 2015. By this time I'm being medicated by his doctor. He's giving me anti-anxiety meds, giving me you know, had already tried to give me antidepressants. They didn't work for obvious reasons, I hope. I wasn't sleeping. I had insomnia. I'd wake up with panic attacks. My, you know, I, I, I needed to sleep, but my ability to do so was really, really compromised at this point. And I kept thinking that um, I just wanted to hear him or know if he came in so I could be aware, so I could be ready for what was going to come in with him. And at some point I go back down 
stairs. I, I don't really know at what point I gave up and stayed behind my barricaded door, but I managed to go to sleep. I took some sleeping pills. What do you got? Yeah, tenses are all over the shop now. As far as I'm con concerned, shoves, has, holding, wondered, has, bashing, just all over the place. Uh, but at some moment, I'm up in his face. Well, okay, at some moment, there's all this stuff going on. And then at some moment, well, I, I want to know, like, how that, how, how are you up in his face? How did that happen? I remember slapping him. Okay, so we're, we, we do have some remembrance of that. Stormed off, slammed the door. <clears throat> well, that's aggressive, not protective, I would say. If I, if I were worried about myself, I wouldn't be storming off and slamming doors. I would be running away and locking myself somewhere, maybe quietly. I would be more silent, more... No, no, that's just me. It's not her. So, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm worried about that. Um, I don't know if I eventually barricaded. Okay, so, so, so eventually you might have. So, eventually, so what happened before? If you eventually did, like what happened before all of that eventuality? And by the way, if you don't know, is it possible that none of it? happened well that's my worry about this because in cross i mean that's a that's a disaster for cross examination because it's just all over the shop and so there are some that some of what we're hearing there does make some kind of sense not particularly in this one i mean we may have heard some stuff before that had some kind of sense to it but but this stuff under cross examination i don't think is going to go very very well, and there might be a good reason why it's not going to go well. Scott, what do you think? All right. She's displaying, displaying tons of facial cues, lots of things that she should be doing. Anger, disgust, contempt, worry, frustration, you name it, and it's in this clip. Um, I'm under the impression a lot of it is truthful. For example, when she says she barricaded the door, I think maybe she locked the door. But I think she's adding all these things on to it, and that's why it seems and feels like we were talking about earlier. That's why... It, some people watch this are going to say, this just doesn't seem right. I know it looks right or something, but I don't know what it is. I'm not sure what it is, but something's just not right here. I think that's what it is. Her cadence is a little bit faster. Her tone is high, and it's kind of restricted. And her gestures and illustrators land, land right where they should for the emotions she's displaying in this case. Lots of micro expressions and flat out full on expressions of, of the emotions we should be seeing. But I think she's she's... She's not being as dramatic as she, as she should be, I think, as she is in these other ones. If somebody's doing all this, if all this is having you say, I had to barricade, I barricaded the door. I'd say it twice. I had locked the door. I had to put stuff in front of it, man. I had to barricade the door. I'd talk about putting stuff in front of it. What did she barricade the door with? I mean, that's what I was, man, I had to push the dang dresser in front of the door to make sure it didn't stay. And I wouldn't be going to sleep. If I had to barricade the door, I wouldn't be going to sleep. Then she's not sure he can't get in through somewhere else. But she's barricading the door. Why didn't she go out through one of those other exits? I, it just, it makes no sense to me. Makes no sense at all. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, if you're, if you're worried about your personal safety on the Maslow's Pyramid, you're not worried about anything else above it. That's, that's priority number one. Well, this is a, I'm just referring to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I think, Scott, exactly what you were saying. I had the same thought this morning, writing down the, the, these things in my notes, Barricading versus locking a door uh, is an extremely adding on these details that never happened. And this speaks to the diagnosis that she received uh, of, of histrionic personality disorder. And if you're on anti-anxiety, antidepressant medications, and you're mixing that with a lot of cocaine or grapefruit, believe it or not, grapefruit is horrible uh, to combine with a lot of those medications. Yeah, you're going to have panic attacks. You're going to wake up at night. And you're going to need to take a couple of sleeping pills and maybe a bottle of Malbec, as, as she calls it. <laughs> and so let's go through this really fast. I remember she's shifting to present tense, talking about shoving me. There's present tense in the throat, present tense, holding me there. All her internal thoughts are crystal clear in her memory. Every single thought that she's ever processed, it's Almost, I'm exaggerating a small bit here, but it's like she could recall the thread count of the living room rug, but doesn't know whether or not there was a fight. And 
she's saying in my recollection it hadn't been that long back to present tense there's throw it up against the fridge i remember slapping him across the face now there's that term again i remember what she used in her testimony 187 times and then she's back to past tense recall i didn't count that myself but uh sadie actually counted that the prime minister of behavior sadie we love you shows a lot of disgust for this uh doctor she's saying i'm being medicated as if it's against her will and she kind of glances over at the jury to kind of just say, yeah, I'm, I'm getting medicated by this person. And she wants you to see this helpless person. She, of course, she willingly took these medications. The entire final 30 seconds of this video is horrible, in my opinion. Uh, there's shifting artificial emotional expressions on the face every few seconds that I have never seen. This rapid thing Scott was just talking about a few minutes ago, this rapid shift of facial expressions. And then there's unusual recall with this deliberate adding of very specific details, just just e exactly to feed a narrative. And there's force feeding of that same narrative of the helpless and perfect victim. I'm willing to bet, in my opinion, she got some legal advice that, honey, you need to go all the way on this. You need to go 300% what you think you could. And if you're worried about per perjury, all of this is going to be extremely hard to prove. No one's going to be able to prove it in, in the opposite direction. And I think uh, maybe she was given some bad advice because this is going to be horrible, I think, if uh, Depp has competent counsel uh, during the cross-examination. That's all I got. Greg? Yeah, the cross-examination on this is going to be brutal, in my opinion. Number one, because they've had all of this that she's putting out, just like you said, Chase, the more details you put out, the more there is to your story and the easier it is to attack. Number two, they get a week of watching game tape before they come back in. This is going to be brutal, in my opinion. But here, word stress matters. I agree with everything you guys have said, and I'm going to add a few little nuances. Word stress matters. When a person stresses a word, in my old word, world, we would call that a source lead. When somebody said something, I go, they said something for a reason. She says, he shoves me. He shoves me. Hmm. That usually indicates there's been something happened before. When you say me and you emphasize me, there's probably been a little shoving back and forth. My guess is that's how all these things got to where they got. She feels prepared and she's editing as she's speaking. When he, she says, he has me up against the throat, this sounds like Roundsburg's mantra, dash, steering wheel, phone, whatever, you know, his little thing. She's doing the same thing. And then she gets out of sequence and she goes, she says now, he was had me up against the wall, then it was the fridge, and then she says, well, it was that area. We were moving in that area. That's excessive. Hey, the guy slammed me against the wall, had me by the throat. I don't need to hear that he moved you from the couch to this to that. Again, more details. He let go of my grip. Does she mean he let go of his grip? Again, words are coming apart. We know that happens when a person's getting a little disjointed and they're walking through. Then she goes to the reason why all this is happening. He was medicating me for obvious reasons. I hope I don't really understand what that means. You should be able to tell I'm sane, I think is what that means. Here's the last thing I'll leave you with. There is a almost 100% guarantee that if you have PTSD, one of the traits you'll have is hypervigilance. And that means that you're always concerned. You're always feeling on edge. You're always having that all that problem. I've never known a person who had PTSD, who would want to take sleeping pills and sleep near the imminent threat that caused them yep. to be there to start with. Just, I don't see it. So we're on the same page there. That's it. You nailed it. Yeah. I remember eventually in this interaction, he shoves me up against the fridge. Uh, he has me by the throat and he just was holding me there by my throat. And I wondered if the if it was the drugs, I wondered if it was him. It hadn't, in my recollection, hadn't been that long. He has me up against the throat, just kind of bashing me against the, the wall next to the fridge. We're kind of moving in that area. And at some point, I'm in his face. And he had, he, I don't know if he had let go of my neck or loosened my grip, but I remember slapping him across the face. 
screaming at him, screaming at me. I got my hand free when I, when he tried to grab me when I walked off. I stormed off, I slammed the door upstairs. I don't know if it was in that instance or if it was in a later one that I eventually barricaded the, the door. Um, you know, I, I couldn't, it wouldn't stop him from coming in. He could come in the other doors. You know, there's plenty of, there's a back door, there's a patio, but at least I'd hear it. And my, this is March, 2015. By this time I'm being medicated by his doctor. He's giving me anti-anxiety meds, giving me you know, had already tried to give me antidepressants. They didn't work for obvious reasons, I hope. I wasn't sleeping, I had insomnia, I'd wake up with panic attacks. My, you know, I, I, I needed to sleep, but my ability to do so was really, really compromised at this point. And I kept thinking that um, I just wanted to hear him or know if he came in so I could be aware, so I could be ready for what was gonna come in with him. And at some point I go back down stairs. I, I don't really know at what point I gave up and stayed behind my barricaded door, but I managed to go to sleep. I took some sleeping pills. That's what it was. He started to tell me that everyone had warned him about me and that he wished he had never married me, wish he had never met me. Um, no, no one liked me. You know, it sounds uh, childish, but uh, I, I remember feeling really hurt. And then at some point I shove him hard to get him off me. And he shoved me back and he said, do you want to go, little girl? Did that, um, I couldn't, as I sit here today, tell you if that happened before he choked me up against the wall, but at some point, um, I am in a, in a, like a, a struggle with him where I'm holding his shirt lapel. Um, and he kind of just flings me for lack of a better way to describe it, throws me, um, uh, across the room. I land on the, a games table. It's like a ping pong table. And I don't know if I was holding on to him or if he pursued me separate, but he gets on top of me on the games table and is just whacking me in the face, like repetitive. Um, we struggle on the games table. I don't know. I don't know how we get up. I don't know if he pulls me up. I wish I could tell you, but we were in this struggle down in this, this games room by the bar. And, um, and we had this conversation about the, the drinking or argument about the drinking. And, um, he holds up this bottle to me. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm saying, did, did you drink this whole thing? Something stupid, uh, focusing on this detail. And he, um, is telling me that I can't control him anymore. And, um, that if I really, you know, if I really wanted to try, take it. And then he's like taunting me to take the bottle from him. Uh, if I really, if I really want him to stop, why don't I, why don't I take it from him? Go on, go on. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it, it started to get more honest in places. Now, obviously the stories are all over the place and I'm not even going to get into that. Um, there's uh there's disgust there's disdain and there's anger and more delicate chin boss action there around which, which which would suggest to me some real feelings there of of disgust and disdain and anger and sorrow around um no one liked me uh you know he wishes he'd never married me never met me and no one liked me i think there is some true feeling that she has around that and then she eye blocks she turns away and says uh how childish it all is and i think that's you know 
probably the most honest thing or the most insightful thing that has been said because it truly is uh, childish what's happening here because I think we are seeing, um, in my opinion, something of this wounded child that's showing up now, this wounded child that feels um, nobody wants her, nobody loves her, nobody even likes her and the pain of that. Now that's getting extrapolated potentially out into all kinds of behavior and all kinds of stuff that is is very, very troublesome. But quite honestly, at the core of this is a real true pain for that little girl that's, that's truly there at this point. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, so you're dead on. She starts off by softening her body language, her head kind of tilts. And when you take 13 pounds of dead weight and tilt it to your right, it softens your body. Your body kind of crimples a little. The inner brow tips pointing up indicate sorrow. And whatever causes the sorrow, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, you're gonna have those inner brow tips rise. Her eyes go down to that, down right to that emotional eye accessing. When, if you have never seen it, this before, sit and think about a, an emotional moment in your life and you'll find your head drifting down to your right. That head then is going to drip, pull your body out of line and all that. She trails off when she says, and she does your fading facts, Scott, when she talks about childish, because she knows how childish it sounds. Here's something big, and we're going to see this three times, three times in the videos you're going to watch, and this is an indicator of something big about to happen. She does this. She scrunches her mouth to the right and bites the inside of her mouth, and it happens three times. It happens here just before the first major altercation downstairs, before she breaks this bottle. We're going to see it two other times. This, to me, makes me think, yes, there's violence, and yes, she's engaged in it if she didn't start it. Now, it, when we hear him talking about her talking about sliding or being c controlled and him talking about restraining, if she started the violence, you would expect he's going to do something to restrain it. I'm not protecting him, just saying violence starts somewhere. And we see it in her here. We see that weird thing, and we're going to see it two more times as we go through this. Just pay attention to it. When he said, do you want to go, little girl? When she does that, she bites her lip, she breaks eye contact, takes a deep breath, and then she goes, the, the, that. She pauses a little bit. I think that's its own now kind of mindset. And then she goes into that disclaimer again, and she says, I can't tell you the order things went. Flings, there's no illustration whatsoever. And she says, he threw me. But she does show helplessness, palms up and that. And then she goes to a calm voice. Go on, go on, go on. None of that seems to fit. You would expect more animation. You would expect people to be more aggressive. A couple of things to notice here. The attorney is sitting with data intake, just paying attention to what's going on. But if you notice that you see some concern in the brow of Johnny Depp and you see his mouth narrowing, this is really the crux of this brawl where he lost his finger, however it happened. So this is going to be an interesting one to pay attention to. Chase, what do you got? Let's talk a little physics here for just a second. Picking up Amber, throwing her across a room, across a room and onto a table is pretty difficult. And then her testimony is that maybe he landed on top of me because I grabbed onto him. Because he is so strong that when he throws another person, it picks himself up and flings both of them across a room and they land onto a table. I thought that was pretty surprising uh, listening to this whole thing. And then it's uh, back to the word starting. He's starting to tell me this. But I think there's some truthful recall that she was hurt by the comments about people not liking her. Uh, she's shifting to present tense again, right at the point where I shove him. She's saying I shove him. And the conflicts in her memory are at the exact points when she wants to insert details about the timeline and the narrative. Then she's back to present. He throws me. I land, present tense, gets on top of me, whacking me in the face. We struggle, present tense. He holds up this bottle, present tense again, makes a mistake. He holds up this bottle. She's narrating as if she's the one holding it. She accidentally, I think, shifts into first person of the aggressor here. She's the one holding the bottle. And actually, she accidentally slips here and says, did you drink this whole thing? 
He's not asking that of her. She's the one asking that of him. While I think she's the one holding this bottle. I don't think he's holding the bottle at all. I'll go out on a limb here. I think she's holding the bottle. And I think she's the one pressing him. Did you drink this whole thing? And she shifts back to present. Uh, he's taunting me to take the bottle back to present tense. And there's a deceptive mix of truth with uh, deception being the deception being the added violence here, in my opinion. And I think there's is a blend of three things. We could call it a, a verbal braid. We could do it a braid, a French braid, maybe. It's a truth, half truth and deception all being blended together so that it's hard to see where one stops and the other one starts. But I think if we're watching closely, listening to those shift in tenses and we're listening to where are these unusual gaps in memory and unusually detailed recall of memory are occurring, it's a pretty good bet that we're going to spot some of this stuff. But if you're seeing these rapid changes in facial expressions, like Scott was saying a minute ago, very, very unusual stuff. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, y'all have covered most everything, so I'll, just, I'll go short on this one. But in the beginning, we're seeing plenty of disgust and contempt expressions. And disgust is the one you see when your nose is all wrinkly and your lips are sort of pursed and they come up like that. Sometimes your, your teeth will show if you've got a, a blend of emotions going there, like anger. We'll see that sometimes. Most of the time, her contempt shows up on the left side. I don't know why that is, but most but for most people, it's it's... On the right side, I think it's the right side. But for hers, for some reason, it's on the left. She does some on the right, but a lot of it is on the left. That's the only asymmetric uh, facial expression when you see something like that. Um, the things she's talking about are the things that he said to her and about her that are negative. Again, she's the good person. He's the bad person. He's saying bad stuff about her. This personality type will not have that. They won't let you. They, they won't let you do that. She let it happened, you know, he, he did it, but they will not let you get away with it without the re, you know, taking revenge on you for that. I think that's a lot of what we're seeing here as well. All right, that's all I got. That's what it was. He started to tell me that everyone had warned him about me and that he wished he had never married me, wish he had never met me. Um, no, no one liked me. You know, it sounds uh, childish, but uh, I, I remember feeling really hurt. And then at some point I shove him hard to get him off me. And he shoved me back and he said, do you want to go, little girl? Did that, um, I couldn't, as I sit here today, tell you if that happened before he choked me up against the wall, but at some point, um, I am in a, in a, like a, a struggle with him where I'm holding his shirt lapel. Um, and he kind of just flings me for lack of a better way to describe it, throws me, um, uh, across the room. I land on the, a games table. It's like a ping pong table. And I don't know if I was holding on to him or if he, pursued me separate, but he gets on top of me on the games table and is just whacking me in the face, like repetitive. Um, we struggle on the games table. I don't know. I don't know how we get up. I don't know if he pulls me up. I wish I could tell you, but we were in this struggle down in this, this games room by the bar. And um, and we had this conversation about the, the drinking or argument about the drinking and um, he holds up this bottle to me um, and you know, I'm, I'm saying, did, did you drink this whole thing? Something stupid, uh, focusing on this detail and he um, is telling me that I can't control him anymore and um, that if I really, you know, if I really wanted to try, take it. And then he's like taunting me to take the bottle from him. Uh, if I really, if I really want him to stop, why don't I, why don't I take it from him? Go on, go on. And kind of gesturing with the, the bottle towards me. 
And uh, like Dean does that two or three times, I reach for it, he'd revoke it, kind of laugh at me. And he's holding out the bottle, I think like maybe the third time or so I get a hold of it. I pick it up and I slam it down on the ground right in between us. There's a tile floor, a white tile floor. And I smash the bottle on the floor. And that really set him off. <sighs> so stupid. Um... Mark, what do you got? Yep, really simple. We've got childish teasing going on and then unmoderated anger going on. She says, so stupid. Again, you couldn't be more accurate, more correct about this. Uh, it's the most adult thing that's being said here, which is to do childish teasing around somebody who isn't going to moderate their anger. Both parties here. This is a really bad combination. And so, of course, we get what we get in this. We've got two people who are uh, unmoderated and children, uh, childish, uh, they, they, with somewhat of maybe an arrested development or, you know, there's certain drugs that get taken or a lifestyle that gets led and not having people around to help with that moderation. It's a really bad combination. Anyway, that really sets him off, she says. Well, that's very unspecific, isn't it? What do you mean? What do you mean sets him off? What happens during that? So again, I don't like the unspecific nature of that, but I think what's being said here is actually very, very honest and perceptive about the situation that's going on. Scott, what do you think? All right, I'll, I'll talk about Johnny for a couple minutes. Um, he's adapting in his chair. We talked about that in, in the last show, how he sway, sways back and forth a little bit. And then when he touches his head, that's similar to when somebody kind of sneaks an adapter when they're talking about something they're uncomfortable or they're being put on point and they'll talk and say, well, I'll tell you what I think about so-and-so. And, -so. and the, the adap an adapter is something you use to get rid of that built up stress and or tension. And when you push on your face right there and let go, you'll feel that muscle kind of relax in there. You feel your face relax. Or when you push on your chin or your mouth, those types of things. And his eyebrows shoot up with that ex exacerbated facial expression. That lets us know he's really uncomfortable with what she's saying. And the eyebrows uh, also indicate the concern along with his deep breath that this, this, really brought, this really bothers him. So we can add those as adapters here as well. But overall, I, I think he's really ill at ease here. So I agree with you, Mark. I think this has probably got a lot of, a lot of truth in it. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Uh, got a lot of the same stuff. There's a lot of present tense here during very key points. I'll let you look at that. But there's also a shift to internal dialogue when her eyes move down and to her left. There's gaze aversion where she's looking away during very key points here. I'll let you take a look at what that is. But the emotional impact is perfectly timed with the eye contact of the jury. Perfectly timed so that she delivers to the camera which is the jury, she delivers to the audience the exact emotional impact at the exact right time. And a lot of this is deviation. There's a lot of confirmation glances, unnecessary detail, and repetition of the word floor right here. So we see repetition to make sure that I'm forcing visuals into a person's head. I'm forcing this person to visualize or, or, or think of something or construct an image in their head. That's all I got. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm not going to add much. I agree with you guys. She touches her face once as she as she's trying to change direction when she says that really set him off. And agree with you, Scott. Watching Johnny Depp, you can see he does a heavy inhale, heavy exhale, and hard eye contact. I associate that kind of with frustration. So I think that's what we're seeing. That's it. Right. And kind of gesturing with the, the bottle towards me. And... Uh, like Dean does that two or three times, I reach for it, he'd revoke it, kind of laugh at me. And he's holding out the bottle, I think like maybe the third time or so I get a hold of it. I pick it up and I slam it down on the ground right in between us. There's a tile floor, a white tile floor. And I smash the bottle on the floor. And that really set him off. So stupid. Um, I, 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 I honestly don't remember if I um, 
threw anything in his direction. I, I don't think I did. Um, I just remember him having me by the nightgown. Um, I remember him flailing me, throwing me around. I'm flailing. Um, I, this is after um, there were some bottles broken on the floor. Uh, I think this is actually after, again, forgive me, I wish I could remember the sequence, but it's flashes. He's throwing these bottles at me. Um, I remember retreating. There were also cans, like uh, soda cans, beer or soda cans. And they're coming at me one after the other. And I keep pulling myself into the bar area. There's a bar behind me in like a, I don't know, like an L shape. He's standing in the only way you can exit. So I'm kind of trapped in front of this sink, surrounded by bar on three sides with him in front of me-ish kind of front off to the off to the left and he's throwing these bottles one after the other and I can feel glass breaking behind me I remember feeling um one of them go by my head really fast I mean the, a velocity a real velocity I remember being terrified I remember I couldn't move I couldn't go anywhere um I eventually I'm trying to I don't know, he ran out of things to throw. I think that's how I moved myself towards the exit. And I believe that's most likely when we got kind of in this struggle by the bar area. Um, All right, I'll go first on this one. We see another huge one-sided shoulder shrug. And like we talked about before, that indicates she's not totally comfortable with her answer. It doesn't really mean it's deceptive. There are no absolutes. That means just because somebody does something, scratches their nose or bites their mouth, it doesn't mean they're being deceptive or telling the truth. It's just one of those, uh, a cue you look for to add to a, to a group of cues to make sure uh, things are going in the direction you think they're going. Um, the biting on one side of her mouth seems to be a, seems to be an adapter at that point, but it falls right in line with all the other cues that she's displaying. Um, to show she's tentative, unsure, and uncomfortable. And she's displaying plenty of, of anger, disgust, and contempt cues, and a lot of what we've seen up to this point. And also, there's that word again, remember. Here it is one more time. And let's pay attention to how it's being used up to this point. It's just here and there right now. It's not very often, it's sparingly, but it's getting ready to, to go off the rails with it here in a couple of minutes. So this is important. So start listening for it and start counting them when you hear them. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? <clears throat> yeah, so that biting the side of the mouth, I agree with you, is typically an adapter. It's bigger than an adapter with her here because she does it three times in three videos, and they're all pre-violence. If I am a child and I always do that and I get away with it, I'm probably going to do that the rest of my life. And that's not an acting thing. She didn't learn that somewhere, and that's part of a character she's prepared for. That's probably something as a little kid, they would get after her and she'd do, mm, and they'd think it was cute or something. Don't know. But what I will tell you is it shows up three times. All three times are pre-violence. Something that's an indicator in her case, just her case. Other one, she rubs her face and you would think she's got tears there or something. There was no tears in her face as far as we can see. She does one of the best denials I've seen in forever, meaning the worst. I honestly, one shoulder rise, don't think I did. Well, that's about as far as you can go to saying I did without saying it, because we associate one shoulder, as Scott said, with not be feeling certain or uncomfortable with what we're saying. And it's very pronounced in this case because she does this most of the time. I honestly, there's a qualifier. So she's distancing and qualifying at the same time and then says, don't think I did. So she's got another cutaway. That's a long sentence. She threw a bottle, clearly. I mean, this is now starting to look like maybe Johnny Depp's telling the truth. So we just have to follow it. Uh, I just, she goes, I just remember inside of her mouth, she bites that thing. And then I, I, I'm almost certain she threw a bottle at him here and that's what started whatever happened here. Then she does a tongue jut at the end of him flailing or throwing her around. I'm flailing. She does a distaste. After some bottles broken on the floor. Well, that sounds a lot like, yeah, that's passive voice. There's a whole bunch of broken bottles. Then she goes in that again, forgive me, and she does a whine in her voice. She does a tense shift. There's more illustration about the bar and where she went than there is about the violence going on again. If I'm going to be that 
use that many illustrators, be that illustrative of what's going on, I'm probably going to do some of the other piece. And then finally, what we see is what I always refer to as going down the well. And I've seen it in the interrogation room plenty of times a person starts finding a way to feel worse and make themselves more emotional and curl up into a ball. And they do it all the time as a way to avoid the question, a way to avoid other things. And then I see her eye block, close her eyes at as she starts talking about the struggle in the bar area. She's going down a well to prepare for this next thing that we'll talk, we'll cover. But that's the second time something's up with that specific piece of body language. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This is a rare time that I will stake my reputation on this. Uh, this is deception. You don't hear me say it often. In my opinion, this is deception. This is what it looks like. More remembering, she's saying there's some broken bottles on the floor. Forgets how, completely forgets. We'll, we'll memorize the type of wood the floors are made of in the house, the exact color and type of tiles, the table that she was thrown into, how many towels are in the dryer at that exact moment. I don't know how many details she can get except for how those bottles got broken. I think that we're, we're skipping over some details here. <clears throat> And I think she's obsessing with how, how destructive he is. And this is likely distancing language that she's the one who probably created this mess. And it looks like she's making accusations of the things that he is saying that she did. She's just redirecting every single accusation backward. Uh, she redirects again to her problems with sequence. And this is the only time we see this is is when the detail needs to be inserted it flashes it's uh flashes it's there's an eye contact uh flutter avoidance where the eyes are just fluttering like greg's screen right now just <laughs> avoid it never had that happen ever <clears throat> and she's saying i remember retreating shifting back to the present there's a bar behind me. I'm trapped. He's throwing these bottles one after the other. I remember bottle breaking, terrified, couldn't move. I believe that's when we got in the struggle. When she's saying all this detail, this added detail and pretend confusion are a very classic case that's often seen in cases of malingering and faking or pretending memories. It's right here in the textbook. And they teach this. It's well reviewed. It's peer reviewed in multiple. I'm talking more than 50 academic articles that talk about this specific behavior and three or four of more of the behaviors that she's exhibiting here in this video that directly goes into fabricating stories and fabricating a mental illness, which is what we're seeing. Here. Yeah. Uh, Mark, uh, what do you think? I think Mark's already been. Oh, no, you haven't. No, I haven't. Oh, okay. I, so. I thought it was uh, Okay, no sorry, dude. No. Uh, yeah, look, well, I, I got no, not much to add, actually, Scott, because, uh, Chase, if, if your reputation is going down, then mine's going with you. Because I, I have up here, big cluster of deception. And then over here, cluster of deception. I mean, it, it, it is just a massive, massive cluster of deception going on here. The only things I have to add into the list that everybody has given here is, look, we, we said right at the start that this disgust and disdain and some of the anger is a bit of a baseline for her and i think there's a that's that's about personality or potentially in my opinion personality disorder potentially um but she masks it with her hand she shows disgust and disdain and then she does a mask and blocks and then it shows again so just another piece of deception there that that we catch her in uh an out breath big out breath uh, e at the start, there's there's an indecision as to how to go about even talking about this stuff at the start. So there's clear self monitoring around here, a clear understanding of I'm going to say something that might not be accurate and I really need to slow it down, work this out, protect myself, shade some of the feelings that I'm going to have. So a Big, big cluster there. And, and what a massively different story than Johnny Depp's. Um, so there's nothing really that aligns about the two. Now, of course, one person could be lying and the other person could be telling the truth, okay? 
but they were both there at the same time. And there's zero, I would say, alignment about this story. Zero alignment, which is which is really odd. Huge deception. There, I'm going down with you, Chase. I, 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 I honestly don't remember if I um, threw anything in his direction. I, I don't think I did. Um, I just remember him having me by the nightgown. Um, I remember him flailing me, throwing me around. I'm flailing. Um, I, this is after um, there were some bottles broken on the floor. Uh, I think this is actually after, again, forgive me, I wish I could remember the sequence, but it's flashes. He's throwing these bottles at me. Um, I remember retreating. There were also cans, like uh, soda cans, beer or soda cans, and they're coming at me one after the other, and I keep pulling myself into the bar area. There's a bar behind me in like a, I don't know, like an L shape. He's standing in the only way you can exit, so I'm kind of trapped in front of this sink, surrounded by bar on three sides with him in front of me-ish, kind of front off to the, off to the left. And he's throwing these bottles one after the other and I can feel glass breaking behind me. I remember feeling um, one of them go by my head really fast. I mean, the, a, veloci a real velocity. I remember being terrified. I remember I couldn't move, I couldn't go anywhere. Um, I eventually, I'm trying to, I don't know, he ran out of things to throw. I think that's how I move myself towards the exit. And I believe that's most likely when we got kind of in this struggle by the bar area. Um, I'm on the countertop. It had me by the neck. And he felt like he was on top of me. And I'm, lo I, I'm looking at him in his eyes. And I don't see him anymore. I don't see him anymore. It wasn't him, it was black. I've never been so scared in my life. It was, it was black, I couldn't see him. And he was looking at me and I was trying to get through to him. I was trying to say to him in some way that it was me. I was trying to get through to Johnny and I couldn't see him, I couldn't see him at all. And my head was bashing against the back of the bar and I couldn't breathe. And I remember trying to get up and I was slipping on the glass. My feet were slipping, my arms were slipping on the countertop. And I remember just trying to get up so I could breathe, so I could tell him that he was really hurting me. I didn't think he knew what he was doing. I don't know how... <laughs> I'm sorry. I, mean, I couldn't breathe. Please. I don't know. Please, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't get through to him, I couldn't, I couldn't get up, I couldn't get up. And I don't know how that ended, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know what happened next, I don't understand. I, 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 God, I will, when I, the, the next thing I remember. All right, I'll go first on this one. Uh, obviously, uh, Johnny is experiencing anger, and we see that with his flared nostril, nostrils and that deep sniff he's taken. And uh, as for Amber, this is somebody who's, who's trying to relay panic. She's panicked here, but she's not panicked because of what happened. She's not relaying the panic she went through. She's relaying the panic she's in now because she doesn't think anybody believes her at this point. I think she's realizing this thing's out of hand and it's gotten away from her. 
and she's panicked because uh like greg is because the jury isn't buying it as she creates tries to create this monster that's why there's so many breaks in there she doesn't know what to say she's decided i'm going in man i'm going to go in with this all this crying and stuff and it's not working we're, we're, we're not seeing any tears there's no runny nose nothing like that at all and i think greg's got some things about the the tissue that, that she's using but we're, we're not seeing the things we should see and that's mainly the tears and the runny nose and uh, a red face so she's trying to relay panic which she's panicked but she's not panicked about what she's talking about she's panicked because she thinks she spent all this time doing this and this is the crux of what's 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 supposed to have happened it's peaking here you know of how violent and how horrible he is now and what he's done to her and her personality we're supposed to watch her break down but it's not working because if you watch this and you didn't get a little bit of a not a maybe not a giggle but if you didn't think that was really 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 odd then i don't know what to tell you but keep in mind we're not saying we're, we're just talking about the body language we're seeing here this is my opinion nothing else we know other people have gone through this and have it a lot worse than 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 she's had it similar experiences and experiences a hundred thousand times worse than this that do experience this but i don't think that's what we're seeing here i don't think she's experiencing that greg what do you got yeah, I'm just going to hit a couple of things because I think you hit a lot of them and I want to leave a couple. Um, you do see him showing stress movement and breathing and upset and eye contact. She's going down the well. She's doing that thing where she works herself down into a darker and darker place. I'll leave the eyes are black and all that stuff to you guys. She does cover her face like you would expect for a person who is going through something emotional. However, when a person is going through really emotional situations and, and really boiling down typically they're going to break eye contact they're not going to make hard eye contact as they're telling you the story she does that the other weird one for me is she raises her thing to wipe her face and she goes here it's up here between her eyes it's not patting an eye it's not covering her nose if i were going to put some chemical menthol any kind of menthol item to make my eyes water i would probably dab it right in the middle of my nose not in my eye not saying that's what she's done but it seems out of place it seems like something is not right in terms of the overall delivery and then she does this padding in between her nose people have asked did she snort something possible she put something in her nostril to make her nose snot up and all that kind of thing but she shows little private time around something so emotional and then the la the other weird one she immediately goes from that terror face back to her baseline that kind of negativity face it's immediate it's that quick we don't see that usually we see lingering and hanging on from there chase what do you got <clears throat> So back to present shift again. She's I'm on the countertop. Holt had me by the neck. There's past tense, a backwards past tense shift to past with no pronoun. There's no he had me by the neck. And when people have less pronouns, they're more likely to be deceptive. And that's proven. I felt like he was on top of me. Well, was he? We, we don't know. And now it's back to the present moment. I'm looking in his eyes. I think this is partially truthful from seeing him at other times. So I'm thinking that she's pulling in data from a different experience into this current experience here. Uh, she's overacting the sadness, and this is a line that she wants them to really feel. She's making eye contact with as many jurors as she possibly can. The sadness disappears and reappears from her face, which you do not see. We've all conducted tens of thousands of hours of these interviews. I've never seen it. Don't know about you guys. Sadness mm -hmm. disappearing and reappearing suddenly. Super weird. And her, she says, my head was bashing against the back of the bar. No perpetrator there. She doesn't talk about who was doing that. So that's distancing language. And she's describing basically a scene from Die Hard. There's no injuries. She's describing somebody who was punched, slammed onto a bar, thrown across broken glass, naked, walked across this broken glass, naked, and then emerged without a single scratch on their body. It's, it's Bruce Willis is what we're seeing here. And then again, there's no tears <clears throat> whatsoever. Shifting emotions that are back and forth. And then she mouths the F word. Uh, with her apology to the uh, to the jury with a disgust expression. 
And I'll let you be the judge of what she's really disgusted about. Is that inwardly focused or maybe outwardly focused? But right at the very end of this clip, you'll see this little elbow movement here with both of her elbows, and that's a ventilation gesture. You're more likely to see that after a person is going through something that's very stressful. But keep in mind, deception is very stressful, especially when you know that there's a camera on you and that whatever you do in that moment is going to live in perpetuity. I'm feeling it right now because I'm on YouTube. Uh, I'm not. My camera's let me down. (laughs) <laughs> Stay with us, Greg. Stay with us. We're almost we're almost there. Um, yes, I agree, Chase. It felt like he was on top of me. Well, yeah, that feeling may well be true, but it doesn't mean the actual physical act was actually happening. Though the feeling of somebody on top of you could absolutely be true doesn't mean it's actually happening. Uh, I don't see him anymore. It wasn't him, it was Black. Now, this for me is really important that at this point in the story, uh, Johnny disappears. She's creating this narrative, this idea that Johnny has, has gone. I've never been so scared in my life. It was Black. So she's entered in, now uh, this is past tense again. So again, now I'm worried. You remember right at the start, I was saying, hey, you know, somebody's experienced trauma, they can be in, in present tense talking about history. This is the moment when she's never been so scared in her life and it's now fully in past tense. So it doesn't make any sense. This would be the moment where you'd go, I'm scared for my life. Yeah, it's black, yeah? Now, what is this idea of the blackness and Johnny disappearing at this point? I think this is an act, this is a strategy. She should know, and her counsel should well know, that Johnny Depp, the, the jury are gonna be biased towards Johnny Depp. They are, of course they are, for all kinds of reasons. They're, the best jury in the world is going to like Johnny Depp more than they like Amber. If we were to gamble on that, you know, there's so many reasons why that shouldn't be true, but I think it's a fair gamble that it's gonna be true. And so we need to give that jury an excuse to go against him. If Amber's to win this one, we need to give them an excuse to go against him. Well, what if he's not there? What if it's not Johnny? It's just like Johnny's body. It's just his body is there. Johnny's gone and he's kind of possessed. It's almost demonic possession or he's disappeared. Well, as a jury, we could then go, yeah, I think he was you know, domestically violent, Uh, but it's not really him. So we haven't really said anything bad about Johnny Depp because we don't want to say anything bad about Johnny Depp. I think it's it's potentially a really smart tactic to try and get some kind of bias back from the jury and maybe the public as well. So interesting. But of course, I think what happens because it's it's now in the world of demonic possession, it's now hit the level of horror movie. And she has to create this melodramatic story, melodramatic performance to make that horror movie level of I looked into the blackness and Johnny was gone and all there was was the abyss in front of me. She's got to create a big performance around that. And it and that's not I think her style, uh, that's not the way she does really well uh, as a performer. So it doesn't really work for her, in my opinion. I'm on the countertop. It had me by the neck. And he felt like he was on top of me. And I'm, lo- I, I'm looking at him in his eyes. And I don't see him anymore. I don't see him anymore. It wasn't him. It was black. I've never been so scared in my life. It was, it was black. I couldn't see him. And he was looking at me, and I was trying to get through to him. I was trying to say to him in some way that it was me. I was trying to get through to Johnny. And I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him at all. And my head was bashing against the back of the bar and I couldn't breathe. And I remember trying to get up and I was slipping on the glass. My feet were slipping. My arms were slipping on the countertop. And I remember just trying to get up so I could breathe, so I could tell him that he was really hurting me. I didn't think he knew what he was doing. 
I don't know how. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. I, mean, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> Please. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get through to him. I couldn't. I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. And I don't know how that ended. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know what happened next. I don't understand. I, 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 God. I will. When I... The, the next thing I remember. All right, let's throw around the room and uh, talk about in 30 seconds or less what we think is going on here, what we've seen up to this point, sort of a wrap up. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, I can see all kinds of reasons why she could be being honest and all kinds of reasons why she could be being deceptive here. There is a huge cluster of deception around that really important story about the bottle and then this melodramatic horror movie at the end. I don't like the smell of it. I don't like it at all. Chase. I will say one thing uh, <clears throat> just to consider people that are highly dissociative and a lot of her memories that she's talking about. I don't feel like I was there. I couldn't hear anything. People who have a higher dissociative capacity are less likely to go in, in my, in my experience and in, in my training, less likely to go into first person when they're recalling trauma, just maybe a likelihood. And I will just wrap with this. If you're not a subscriber and this is your first video, we have never, ever been this certain and this convinced about a person uh, since we were reviewing somebody and we were all convinced they were telling the truth. And this was that was over a year ago. Uh, so this is this is an unprecedented, just about unprecedented event for a lot of us here. Greg. Ah, oh, Mark. That feels like a bias, doesn't it? I saw it. Everybody I saw it. You go, oh, you did do that. You, you, you did that for Greg. You don't do that for Chase. <laughs> it's funny. It showed up on my screen to say you're muted. So I got it at the same okay. time. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Look, what we're not saying is she's lying about every element of what she's doing. What we are saying is we looked at a good, solid baseline, and we looked at deviation in baseline, and she's storytelling. The storytelling got a little more elaborate as she went and there were some really good indicators that something is going on in two of those very violent moments if i go back and take my original premise she is more demonstrative about having her feelings hurt than she is about being punched dragged around or flailed around or flying around then we have to worry about which parts of those are real and so for me to look at no slap no slap indicators no punch indicators but a lot of indicators around throwing bottles and throwing cans and those things makes me think there's a hell of a lot of volatility don't know who started what where it went to but then when she does that one most pronounced as I, far as i remember did not throw a bottle honestly then i think okay well maybe johnny depp talking about his hand on the bar and a bottle hitting him sounds a lot more practical so she didn't win any friends or among this group we are pretty certain yeah. there's deception at every turn scott what do you got yeah I agree with all you guys. And it seems like she was telling she was being more honest. We saw less deception when she had less movement, which is really odd as well. The, the, the more calm she was, the more we saw less deception in most of them. There's a couple of them that did, that didn't work. But when she's all flailing around and acting, man, it's, it's all over. I think it's a great study in seeing someone uh, act like they have something wrong with them when they don't. I think it's a great study of seeing someone um, put good or good against evil 
and create that, try to create that thing. I don't think her lawyers, as much as she's probably paying them, are that good because they wouldn't let that happen. I, I don't think they, and, and we know this, they would have tightened that story up. They would have gotten everything tight. And there's nothing tight about what she was talking about in there, nothing. I don't know if was, they were treating her because she's a, a movie star or whatever, but I don't think her, her attorneys were that good. Nobody would have, we wouldn't let somebody go out there and do that. You kidding me? And you can see it was not that we couldn't tell they were going to do that, but we would have made sure. And the next day after they did something like this, we said, listen, man, don't be doing that. Here's what you got to do. Try to do this. I don't think she had any correction on anything either. So I think she's really getting the short end of the stick as far as attorneys go in this case. But I still think it's a, it's a great study in good against evil and some and somebody controlling themselves like as for a guy who's not supposed to be able to control himself and, and get out of whack and all that, he sure is under control in court while she's saying all these things about him, true or false. He sure is under control at that point. And that's a, that's fairly impressive, I think. Now, keep in mind, as we've talked about all these things, we're just telling you what we see and what we think about the body language we're seeing in this. We know there are people who've experienced things similar to this and hundreds of thousand times worse than this that they'll never get over. We know that. So keep that in mind before you go in there and go, you guys don't understand this or that. We understand. We get it. I promise you. So if somebody's treating you that way, get some help. Make sure you get you get out there and get some help for that. Don't let anybody do you that way. No matter how you feel about them when it's over and you think it's fine or whatever, you get that taken care of. That's very important. Very important. Nobody should be treated that way. Nobody. Oh, bicho, não, mas eu não sei se eu...